Well, if you were living in first century Israel, you would know that life was a dangerous proposition. The life expectancy was age 35. Not only was childbirth itself a risky proposition, but accidents were common and people were subject to a myriad of diseases, many of which are outlined in the Bible. In fact, we as 21st century people living in a modern age of science and medicine would be shocked at the amount of disease in that world. And it was right out in front of people every day. Modern healthcare enables our society to hide away the most difficult cases. We put people in hospitals and facilities. We trust doctors to find a cure to fix things. We're more surprised these days when people don't make it. In fact, today, when someone says someone dies in their 60s, we say they were so young. Imagine, imagine. In places like Capernaum and Galilee, death was a daily occurrence. People were intimately familiar with it, up close and personal. Now, there were doctors but they weren't really trained in a medical school. They were usually just practitioners of a kind of folk medicine, and and they were expensive, which meant that they were out of reach for most people. And their primary focus was not so much about providing healing as defining the difference between illness and health, setting up boundaries to keep the sick, the blind, and the lame, and the broken outside of the community. If you go back to the Old Testament, you read the priestly code from Leviticus, as it was interpreted and as it evolved, it minimized the responsibility of the community for the chronically ill. It left them out of sight and out of mind, hoping for the eradication of illness sometime in the future when God's kingdom came, a peaceable kingdom like we read about in places like Isaiah 35, where the promise was that the eyes of the blind would be opened, the deaf would hear, and the lame would leap for joy. But that was going to be someday. In the meantime, lepers, those with a debilitating skin disease, had to shout, unclean, whenever they approached someone. Touching them would make the healthy person ritually unclean. Women were considered unclean when they were menstruating. People who had to handle dead bodies were temporarily unclean. Disease, religion, purity, all kind of bound up together. People were afraid to touch one another. Now, we got a glimpse of this, didn't we? I I remember the pandemic, walking down the sidewalk in Colorado, in the great wide open, and giving people a 10-foot berth walking around them on the sidewalk. Anybody else remember doing this? Remember, we were scared about shaking hands, about breathing the same air, all that kind of stuff. We've seen the effects of what that has done to people effects we're still understanding. The isolation that we experienced, it's debilitating. We just got a taste of it. But there were any number of illnesses or conditions in the first century that could put a person in that kind of place, outside the camp, outside the village. Imagine what it was like for them to have virtually no chance of that isolation ever ending. That's why when Jesus came on the scene, he represented hope to broken people, those separated from their community by disease or uncleanness. It wasn't just healing they were receiving, though. It was restoration, restoration to their families, restoration to community, a sign that the kingdom of God was breaking in. Now, now people didn't know exactly what Jesus was about, but they knew that he had something they needed. In fact, along with the sinners, it was the broken people who seemed to have the first inkling of who Jesus really was. And when we see Jesus through their eyes, we might rediscover his healing power in our own lives. So I chose this particular story sandwich of healing miracles in Mark to illustrate how the healing ministry of Jesus was seen through the eyes of different people. In this case, a synagogue leader named Jairus and an unnamed woman with a history of chronic illness. These are people on opposite ends of the social scale. And yet each of them comes to Jesus with a crisis, a death, an illness that has them at the end of their rope. You know, it doesn't matter how rich you are, doesn't matter what your status is, death, illness is the great equalizer. We all experience it. 
And so Jairus bursts through the crowd that's gathered around Jesus on the shoreline and he falls at Jesus' feet and he begs him repeatedly, my little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her and heal her so that she may, made, may be made well and, and live. Now, if you are a parent, this story resonates with you. If your child's ever been sick, you know that you would do anything it takes You'd beg anyone who could help, no matter how embarrassing it might be for you. Later, Mark tells us that Jairus' daughter is 12 years old, right at the cusp of adulthood in the Jewish world. Her whole life is ahead of her. Jairus recognized that there was something about Jesus, and it didn't matter to him if he was going to be questioned by skeptics in the synagogue about engaging this itinerant rabbi with such a request. After all, remember last week, What happens when Jesus goes to a synagogue in Nazareth? They want to take him out and throw him off a cliff. If you're associated with Jesus, as Jairus is in doing this, they might want to throw you off a cliff as well. Now, laying on of hands is associated with healing in the Bible. James urges those who are sick to have the elders of the church come and lay hands on them so that they can be healed. Laying on of hands is a sign of both blessing and healing, a sign that conveys connection, touch, restoration. Come and lay your hands on her, says Jairus. Jesus goes. But on the way, there's another person seeking healing in the crowd, but doing so in a more subversive way. Jairus' daughter was 12. But think about it, for the same 12 years, this woman had been suffering from a constant flow of menstrual blood, an illness that would have made her perpetually unclean according to the priestly code and made also unclean anyone who touched her. Imagine not being touched, hugged for 12 years. She had tried every solution, She maxed out the deductible, the out-of-pocket limits on her insurance with doctors trying to figure out the problem, but to no avail. So she is desperate like Jairus, and she is willing to risk whatever it takes to get close to Jesus. She even risks the embarrassment of touching him publicly, which would make him unclean. If I but touch his clothes, she believes, I will be made well. Immediately her hemorrhage stopped and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. So with all that crowd pressing in, he felt the touch, interestingly, of only this woman. Recognizing that power had gone out from him to her. Who touched my clothes, he asked. His disciples thought he was kidding. How can you tell who touched you through all this crowd? But the woman comes forth boldly like like Jairus. She falls at Jesus' feet and she tells him the whole truth. She doesn't have to, but she does. She may have expected rebuke for making Jesus unclean. But one of the things you're going to notice when you read through the Gospels is that whenever Jesus shows up and he touches someone who is unclean, they become clean. And he remains clean himself. Daughter, he says to her, your faith has made you well. Go in peace, be healed of your disease. And that's important for what happens next because before they get to Jairus' house, some people come out to say that they're too late. The child's dead. Why trouble the teacher? After all, touching the dead body would make him unclean. But Jesus overhears this and he simply says, do not fear only believe. He takes three of the disciples into the house. He confronts those who are weeping and wailing in grief with a statement that on the surface seems a little bit insensitive, right? I mean, imagine showing up at a funeral and saying, why do you make a commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And so they quickly turn from weeping to laughing at him. Are you nuts? Death won again. This, is this a joke? I mean, are you saying, like in The Princess Bride, that she's not all dead, just mostly dead? Is that what you're saying? But Jesus ignores them. 
And instead he takes the girl by the hand, a touch again that should make him unclean. And he says to her in Aramaic, Talitha kum, or little girl get up, and she does. She's no longer dead and unclean, but she's alive and hungry. It's always interesting in the Gospels when Jesus raises someone from the dead, the first thing he says is, give them something to eat. Death must make you hungry. When Jesus is risen from the dead, he shows up at the disciples and he says, you got anything to eat? Maybe it's a promise of the great banquet in heaven. We're going to react that a little bit later too. We'll see. But the point is that these two stories of healing are kind of wrapped together for a purpose. They're stories of broken people who are restored. And yet these stories, like so many of the healing stories in the Gospels, have common elements that teach us about how to approach Jesus for our own healing and restoration. These are simple things, and yet things that we don't often do because we've become too familiar with Jesus or too convinced by the post-enlightenment world that we should exhaust every other solution first. See, when broken people encountered Jesus in the Gospels, they generally did three things. Three things that if we would do them, we might see the power of God unleashed in a world that least expects it. What's the first thing they did? The first thing they did was they believed. Quite simply, they believed that Jesus could do something to help them. Now, this wasn't the kind of intellectual belief promoted by theologians and preachers. I love what Soji said, you know, starting the service. Like, like I don't really, trying to understand the Trinity, hey man, nobody really does. Okay, let's be, let's be honest. We get the gist of it but there's a certain amount of mystery that goes with that. We're not talking about trying to parse everything out and have it all fit in neat categories. We don't want a kind of theology just where all the I's are dotted and the T's crossed, the kind of faith that puts Jesus' power in a box which we only break glass with in case of emergency. This is the kind of faith on the other hand. This is the kind of belief we see in the text that's born not out of intellect, but out of desperation. Jairus and the woman in the crowd likely didn't know the theological treatise that Jesus was the son of God, that he was the second person in the Trinity, the king of the world. Few people did at this point. Even Jesus' own disciples don't get it at this point. They didn't fully grasp his teaching about the kingdom of God or the reason why the religious leaders were debating him. But here's what they knew. They knew that Jesus of Nazareth somehow had a power that could help them when nothing else could. They didn't know who he was, but they knew what he could do. And they were desperate enough to believe that he could do it for them. The enlightenment disenchanted the physical world. It may have also disenchanted Christian faith as well. We've turned faith into an intellectual exercise, something to be debated, figured out, categorized, quantified. But you notice that is rarely the kind of faith that Jesus responds to in the Gospels. He responds to the simple cry for mercy, the desperate pleading of a father, the desperate grasping of an old woman for his frayed edge of a garment. If I but touch his clothes, I will be made well. A simple, desperate, reaching faith is all that Jesus is looking for. That's the kind of faith that makes you well, even if you don't get the miracle. It's faith that wants to be close to Jesus, to receive whatever he can give, to feel the touch of his hand restoring and healing and lifting us up. Is our belief in Jesus desperate enough? Do you believe that he can help you even if you don't have everything figured out? Do you believe he can make a difference in your life even if you're not yet sure about all this religious stuff? Faith does not have to be figured out in order to be realized. Do not fear, says Jesus to Jairus. Only believe. Only believe. That's the first step toward any kind of healing that Jesus wants to do in our lives. Second thing that these people do is they ask. 
Jairus and the woman in the crowd didn't keep their belief to themselves. They asked Jesus for help. Jairus begged him, embarrassing himself in front of the crowd of his neighbors. The woman risked being further marginalized by her neighbors by reaching out to touch the popular rabbi. Many people may have been reaching out to touch Jesus, but he alone recognized her touch as a request. It was her silent but sincere asking that caused the power to go out from him. Read the Gospels enough and you begin to notice how many times he invites people to ask for what they need. Ask and it shall be given to you, he says. You have not because you ask not. Jesus has to say these things because we are reticent to ask. Maybe we're afraid, maybe we're tentative, maybe we figure we can handle it on our own. Oh, we might intellectually believe, but to really believe enough to ask Jesus for the miracle? No, that would be silly and embarrassing. When I was in seminary, I, I was, uh, part of our program was we had to do a semester of rotation with a chaplain's office in a hospital. And so I did my rotation at Christ Hospital in Cincinnati. And I put it off till very late in my seminary thing because I did not want to do this. I had no desire to go there. And, and of course, you know, I sat with the chaplain and he said, so tell me about your past. And I told him my stuff and I talked about my mom. You know, have you spent much time in the hospital? Well, when my mom was in the hospital, she was dying of cancer. He says, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to assign you to the oncology floor. Thanks very much. And I dealt with death every day. And I wore a pager and, uh, and when there was a code in the hospital, if you were on call, you know, somebody was dying, they got the crash card out, they would buzz me and have me come. At, at that point, I didn't know what I was supposed to do, but I showed up. So I would show up and I would stand at the door, just stand there, say a little silent prayer, maybe something like that. And one of those times I show up and the doctor's nurses are working on the patient and I'm standing there at the door and the doctor looks at me once, he looks at me again, sees my chaplain badge and he does this. And I walk in, he says, I don't know what you're doing standing at the door. He said, but this man needs you now more than he needs me. Do your thing. I mean, you're the, you're the healing presence of Jesus. See, I was embarrassed to go in the room because I was embarrassed that I might pray the wrong prayer or, or pray for a miracle then, and then when that doesn't happen, then that's going to be really embarrassing. I was ashamed. But you want to notice something in the gospel. You notice that Jairus and the woman, neither one of them cared about how their request to Jesus looked to others. They were past embarrassment. They simply asked. St. Augustine puts it this way, few are those who by faith touch him, multitudes are they who throng about him. Few are those who by faith reach out and ask. Many people, many Christians are familiar with Jesus, even perhaps believe that he can help them, but few are asked. They prefer to remain anonymous in the crowd. And one of the things I've found hardest to deal with over 30 years of ministry is that people don't ask for what they need. Oh, they, they will stew, they will fret, they will get angry, they will rail at the fact that neither God nor the pastoral staff has done anything for them, but they don't ask. The broken people in the gospel stories knew they were broken, they knew they were in trouble, and they asked Jesus for help. Next to belief, asking is the key to setting the conditions in which Jesus can do a deed of power in our lives. And lastly, they believed, they asked, and then they acted. Jairus followed through, even though the people in the house told him they were too late. He still went in the house with Jesus. The woman in the crowd followed through. She came to Jesus, even in fear and trembling, and she took ownership of her situation. Jesus responded to the faithful actions of both. 
See, if we want to be healed, if we want to be restored, we can't merely sit back passively and hope that Jesus does something for us without asking and without responding actively to him. Notice how many times when Jesus says to the lame, get up, pick up your mat and walk. Or he says to the man at the pool of Bethesda, do you want to get well? We have some participation in our own healing. We can't expect Jesus to heal us, for example, if we keep treating our bodies poorly or if we neglect the habits and practices that make for health. Sometimes the basis of a miraculous work in our lives is to simply first do what Jesus commands. You know, day-to-day life is still hard. Though modern medicine has given us some help. But despite all of the advances in modern medicine people still die. Those who received healing miracles from Jesus would die too. This little girl raised from the dead is going to die again. Lazarus is going to die again. That's a sobering thought. That medical miracles, even when we get them, are temporary fixes. But you see, Jesus didn't come to merely be a healer of broken people. He came to make them whole again forever. His healing miracles are signs pointing to a greater future to come. The future ushered in by his death and resurrection. A future in which disease and death are no more. We get glimpses of that future as people did in Jesus' day. Each of these miracles was a sign of God's kingdom breaking in. For them it was enough to stir belief, to ask and to act. So we can pray for healing. We can pray for miracles. We can lay hands on one another and we can do so expectantly knowing that whether it's right now or in the end, Jesus has the power to heal us and make us whole. And this is something we need to do more often as a church to gather and ask God for healing. You know, we, we come out of this sort of mainline Protestant tradition. But we're, not, we're, we're not really into the emotional part of worship. You know, I, I grew up Presbyterian, frozen chosen. If you got your hands above your waist, you were, you were being too charismatic. You know, we, we talk about healing. Some of y'all get nervous. It's going to be like Benny Hinn up here smacking people on the head and people passing out and rolling around on the ground. No, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about what the Bible commands. James, is any of you sick? Call the elders of the church to come and lay hands and pray for their healing. Healing power isn't about theatrics. It's about believing, asking, and acting. And friends, we can't let that kind of healing be strangers to us. Jesus invites us to believe, to ask, to act. I'm going to try something with you this morning. I'll let you get out of your box a little bit. I know there are people in here this morning who are dealing with something some kind of illness, some kind of hurt. It doesn't have to be physical. It could be emotional. Any congregation, there's a lot of hurting people. We want to pray for you this morning. And I mean pray. I want to invite you, if, you, if you're willing to risk maybe being a little bit embarrassed, you're not going to be. We're all here for you. I want to invite you to come to the center aisle. And then I'm going to invite all of us to gather around them and lay hands on as we pray for their healing. Can we do that? Let's do that. Let's gather. I invite you to come to the center as you're able. Oh, Pastor Bob's making us do weird stuff. <laughs> this is biblical stuff, my friends. Just find someone to lay hands on. You may not know what they're, what they're dealing with. You may not know what, what's happening. But you know Jesus does. And if you've taken that step this morning, he's here for you. Let me pray for us. Lord God, people have stepped out in faith this morning, believing. And they're asking 
or whatever it is in their body or in their spirit that needs healing, we're trusting you. And we know that there are many ways you heal us. But Lord, we are asking this morning for power to come out from you. To restore and make whole and make new. Work in bodies, minds, and spirits to bring wholeness. That we as your church may be a place of healing. And that signs of your kingdom would be breaking out in this place right now, today. Send your spirit and renew your creation and your people. We pray this in the name of Christ Jesus, the healer. Amen. Amen. Thank you.